In what sometimes seems a really obvious uh, topic to cover in terms of aerobic versus anaerobic, I think it's probably a really good opportunity for me to cover the ins and outs of exactly why we have two systems that essentially do the same thing, but work in very, very different ways. And also a little bit of a follow on to my previous videos about Angie's system interplay. So today, we're just gonna keep it really short, really simple. What is aerobic, what is anaerobic, and compare the differences between them. So hopefully you get something out of it, and yeah, let's get stuck into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Nick here, talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Make sure if you haven't already, please consider subscribing down below to keep supporting the channel. Been loving making all the videos for you guys so far, and if you're new, welcome. I hope you, uh, hope you get something really good out of this video in terms of understanding a bit further the difference between aerobic and anaerobic uh, energy production, because it is fundamentally a really big part of what is going on in terms of energy systems. And if you haven't already, please check out my two videos on energy system interplay. Uh, I'll link the first one above and I'll link both of them in the description down below. So you can go check those out about how the energy systems interact and, and work together to be able to produce energy uh, in all uh, types of activity, whether you're an endurance athlete, a team sport athlete, you're sprinting, you're, you're running a long distance event, you're cycling, whatever it may be. Energy systems are the fundamental basis to all of that. So go check that one out first. But what I wanted to cover today is just a really simple difference between aerobic and anaerobic. They're very similar looking terms in terms of names, but the, the key difference is that little an at the beginning. And what anaerobic means, A-N aerobic, and I'll put it down below, is without oxygen, without the presence of oxygen. So we're breaking down fuel internally without the need to actually use oxygen. And this is a really amazing thing that the body can do, is that we can create energy without the need to wait for oxygen to come into the system. So what it means is it's really rapid and quick. Now we have two key ways of doing this. We have the ATPPC system or what we call the alactic system and essentially what we call anaerobic glycolysis. And these are two different pathways that anaerobically without oxygen, we can create energy and break down different fuel sources. The ATPPC, we break down a chemical fuel called phosphocreatine in the muscle. It's already in there. It's really rapid, explosive and fast. Anaerobic glycolysis is breaking down carbohydrates, glucose. That's what glycolysis means. And we're breaking down a little bit more complex fuel, but it's still gonna happen quite quickly. So we're gonna get the energy when we need it on demand. If I start, if I get up out of my chair and start running now, I'm gonna get that energy straight away. The difference being is when we switch over to aerobic and we drop the an at the start, we now are in the presence of oxygen. So we're now breaking down fuels with the usage of oxygen. We're no longer breaking down chemical fuels. So we're not gonna get that maximal explosive rapid energy production. We're breaking down glycogen, so glycolysis and glucose, or we're going through things like lipolysis, so the breakdown of fats to be able to get, get fuel as well, which is a really critical part for when we start to get into long distance or ultra endurance type racing, things like Ironman, 100 mile type events, running, ultra running, those types of things where fats become a much more critical fuel source. But what we now have to consider here is the main difference is because we're using oxygen is now we have to worry about the pathway oxygen comes into the body, which is a really simple process of oxygen starts in the atmosphere is within the air already. We have to breathe that in, inhale that, out of the air that gets into our lungs, only a small part of it is going to actually diffuse through what we call pulmonary diffusion, diffuse into the bloodstream and actually get into the blood. We're then gonna transport that through the heart, through the blood vessels in the system to where it needs to go, primarily to the working muscles when we're actually moving, also to the brain as well, to be able to provide some oxygen to break down predominantly carbohydrates to allow the brain to function, make decisions, things like that, and work from a psychological and cognitive perspective. But from a muscle perspective, it's gonna go to the working muscles to allow us to create the energy we need. And because of this process, this is already the first step in terms of how slow it is, is we're having to get oxygen all the way from the outside, all the way through the system to the end point. And that's gonna take time. What is also gonna take time is glucose compared to our PC. So even in anaerobic glycolysis and the, without oxygen, anaerobic glycolysis with ATP PC, the ATP PC system is a hell of a lot faster because it's a chemical fuel. It's essentially like having one, if you had um, one bond between you, just, you split it, bang, happy days, there's our energy. Anaerobic glycolysis, breaking our glucose molecule, isn't overly complex, but there's a little bit more going on. There's multiple connections in that we have to break. Going down to fats again, even more complex, bigger molecule, more bonds to, to break, it's gonna take even longer again. And so what we're getting at here is it's slow enough as it is in terms of oxygen trying to get into the system, but then it's also slow because we're breaking down all of these different components of the fuel rather than having that real simple burn up straight away fuel source to give us the energy. So when we do start to use the oxygen, we go through a couple of different pathways. And I'm gonna focus on aerobic, uh, aerobic glycolysis versus anaerobic glycolysis here because we've got the same fuel source. That makes it really consistent for us to talk about because we're just talking about the breakdown of carbohydrate. When we go through anaerobic glycolysis, basically the molecule just gets smashed in two and we get our energy. That is the end of the process. 
it's a very simple break it in half we're near the energy quick we're just going to get as much as we can take from it and when we smash it we, we get about two to three atp as a result what do we get as a byproduct well we're left with these components we've just taken all the lego bricks apart if you like and just done it as quickly as possible so some are still connected together some are all split apart there's there's no i guess clean distribution of where they go we're not taking all the colors apart and putting them in different piles of red green blue it's if we're talking about lego bricks it's just i've just hit it with a hammer and there's a few pieces there a few pieces there it's kind of disorganized and those disorganized pieces if you like those leftover pieces are what we know as lactic acid pyruvate all of these byproducts if you like of smashing glucose apart that go into their various pathways to give us things like lactic acid and give us that acidity that fatiguing byproduct that we know from a hydronine perspective the the acidic part of lactic acid lactic itself gets reconverted gets taken back to the liver goes through processes where we reconvert it into glucose and usable fuel but when it gets attached to hydronines that's when we have the lactic acid and that's when we get that burning sensation in the legs and we get that increased acidity which isn't good when we have oxygen present though we go through that same process we just smash it with a hammer first because that's the easiest way to get it split up apart what having oxygen present then allows us to do is go through aerobic glycolysis, which goes through a few other steps. So then we get through that first stage, we get a couple of our ATP, that's great, but inevitably it's not a massive amount. Then we put it through what we call the Krebs cycle. So this basically is just a more, uh, I guess, comprehensive process. This would be like when I'm talking about my Lego bricks, have smashed, smashed the, the Lego tower apart. We've got pieces everywhere. There's that first bit of fuel. Now what we're doing is we're taking those bits apart and putting them into their individual components. That's the first little bit. It's going to give us a little bit more in terms of, okay, we've got individual bricks everywhere, but it's still kind of disorganized. So we're now talking about a fuel that's been broken down a little bit further. It's a little bit more manageable and usable. We've only got a little bit more fuel though because we haven't actually sorted anything. The next stage of it is once we get through the Krebs cycle, which is already one complex component, we then move into what's called the electron transport chain, which is the next part where essentially all of the pieces start to move into their own little areas. And this is where, if you, again, coming back to my Lego brick example, we're putting all the blue pieces in one pole, putting all the reds in one pole, the yellows in another, green in another. We're sorting them out into our different bits and now we've got our more complete blocks of energy. And this is where we get the biggest bang for buck. It's this final step of the aerobic glycolysis process that distributes all of our big part of the energy production. That's how we get 36 to 38 ATP in aerobic glycolysis. It's this end stage electron transport chain that gives us the big bucks. So uh, I basically want to sum it up there and saying that's the main difference between aerobic and anaerobic. Just so you're really clear. I know it's probably a really basic topic for a lot of people, but I think the, the need to talk through some of these really base concepts is really useful just to reinforce that understanding of what are the differences we're actually seeing here? Why are these two processes different and why is it a beneficial to be tapping into some anaerobic work or tapping into some aerobic work to benefit our performances? If we understand the base physiology, it's gonna be much easier when implementing in a training sense. As always, hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you do have any questions below or comments, please leave them down below. Please keep supporting the channel by subscribing and share this with anyone you think might uh, get something out of the channel or this video in particular. That is it for today and we'll see you in the next one.